So in this session, we're going to look at some elements of performance, uh, looking at the annual national assessments of 2011. Um, I have to apologize to the people who were in the meeting yesterday, because a lot of it will be repetition. Um, but I think not a lot of the people that were attending this meeting were also attending uh, yesterday's uh, other assessment uh, discussion on research. So what we're going to cover today is to provide some background to the annual national assessments. Um, this is based on a report that we did for the Director General's office looking at the uh, ANA 2011, um, partly funded by UNICEF and was for the DBE earlier this year. Before I go into looking at the annual national assessments, I'm going to give some background to student performance in South Africa um, using other various other um, assessment schemes that you guys have already looked at, such as SACMEC, TIMS, um, NSCS, etc. And then looking at some theoretical reasons behind the ANA, um, looking at accountability, support, uh, also from an indicator perspective at the end we'll look at reports uh, and what is the function that reports might play in increasing accountability in South Africa. So just to give people a uh, a background, I think uh, Safas might have touched on some of these some of these elements in earlier lectures, but to give, a, to give you an overview of performance since 2003 up until last year, how has South Africa performed? So the first one that falls into this band is the Trends in International Mathematics and Science Study, TIMS, which tested grade 8 students in maths and science. Of the 50 countries that were participating, including 6 African countries, South Africa came last. Um, only 10 reached the low international benchmark, and there was also no improvement between the previous TIMS, which was done in 1999, and the TIMS in 2003. So you can see this is South Africa over here, and there are other middle income countries such as Ghana, Saudi Arabia, Botswana, Philippines, Morocco, <coughs> Chile, etc. The next study was the Progress in Reading and Literacy Study, PEARLS which was done in 2006 and tested grade 4 and grade 5 in reading. Um, out of all the participating countries, all 45, South Africa came last. It also included other middle income countries, um, I think Morocco, Iran, Indonesia, um, and I think Ghana also was in this, in this study. Based on analysis, 87% of grade 4 and 78% of grade 5 students were deemed to be at serious risk of not learning to read. Uh, this was because they didn't reach, in other words, the vast majority did not reach the low international benchmark set by PEARLS. The next study was SACMEC, which we've already looked at briefly, um, which came last out of, uh, well, for rural and for poor students, came second to last, which is the next slide. But uh, on the average, you find that South Africa performed much uh, worse than otherwise uh, poorer countries such as Swaziland, Kenya, and Tanzania, and a high proportion of students were illiterate and enumerate. Um, we looked at this briefly as well, where we said that South Africa, uh, in, in the earlier lecture on um, performance, if we compare South Africa but we only compare the poor students, we can see that South Africa does worse than Malawi and Lesotho, and we also talked about the access differentials between these countries in the earlier lecture. <coughs> there was also the National School Effectiveness Study, which was run by uh, JET. It's a panel study testing grade 3, grade 4, and grade 5. And a very, very small proportion of students were at the grade appropriate level. And most recently, and what it will be what our focus is for today, is the annual national assessments, which tested grades 1 to 6 students in maths and reading. Um, and we know that the average scores are roughly around 30% for grade 3 and grade 6 when these tests were calibrated that students should be getting at least 50% if they were um, achieving at the grade appropriate level. If we take the average of schools, and we'll see this later in the study, but if we take the average score across grade 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and across numeracy and literacy, and we calculate the single score for the whole school, 80% of the bottom three quintiles, in other words, the vast majority of schools in these quintiles, um, the school average was less than 50%. In other words, they're not performing nearly at the appropriate level. 
So to provide some background, I think everyone is aware of the Annas. They're not always aware of where they came from. Um, in 2009, uh, Annas were piloted with almost 1,000 schools. And in 2010, all of the provinces agreed to implement the annual national assessments in grades 1 to 6 in numeracy and literacy. In 2011, in February, testing occurred where over 5 million students were tested in all primary schools in South Africa. Um, and this, is, this presentation is trying to report on some of the results that have come from that. So the purpose of ANA, so this is now stepping away from the technicalities, but the, the logic behind ANA and what informs the reason why it was implemented, ANA should help teachers to test at the appropriate level. So we, we've have seen evidence of, for example, grade 6 teachers that are setting tests at a grade 3 level. Um, Whereas when you have a standardized exam that's the same across all provinces, you find that uh, teachers learn what is appropriate level for that particular grade. And it should also help us to target support to where it is most needed. So in the absence of some kind of standardized testing, it's not easy to figure out which schools need what support. If you don't have some form of testing, it's difficult to figure that out. It should also celebrate successful schools it's come up a number of times in these discussions where we said there are some schools in poor areas that are performing very well. And Anna helps us identify those schools and celebrate their success and also learn from that success. Um, and then also, Anna should encourage greater parental involvement in the schooling of their children. Um, so this is one of the reasons why uh, principals and teachers have been encouraged to ensure that the results actually make it back to the parents on how their children are performing. Um, and the focus of this discussion today and of the report was on identifying schools that need support, in other words targeting the support, and secondly about increasing greater parental involvement. So when classifying schools we'll look at this um, one of targeting support and then when we start discussing what the potential reports could look like in South Africa, school reports, then we'll be focusing on greater parental involvement. Okay. So if we look at the international literature, we can see that uh, accountability movements usually have three stages. So in the America, in the States, it is America, in the UK and the US, what you find is that there's this steady sequence of stages that happen. So the first stage is defining what students should learn. Um, in other words, setting the standards. The second phase is measuring achievement, which is where we are testing to see what students actually have learned. And then the last stage is holding accountable. In other words, making those results count. And we can see here that um, I think most people would agree that CAPS is meant to be defining what students should know. Anna is a <coughs> recent example, less than one year old, of actually testing what students have learned and then lastly, well, this is why I put question marks here because we're not sure what form this will take of making those results count. Um, we've talked about it a bit in the Western Cape, the performance agreements with principals. That might be one example of making these results count where if the systemic results do not improve over a five year period or whatever it is, then principals um, employment contracts come up for review. <coughs> So it's also interesting, we need to sort of think about this and figure out, which is what, one of the things we're trying to do here, is what form will this take in South Africa? It's taken a number of other forms in different countries, but given our context of relatively low teacher competence, high union involvement, um, and union power in the South African context, what is this likely to look like? So one of the... the uh, findings that's emerged from the research literature on accountability is that you can't hold people accountable for things that they can't do. Um, one of the ladies here earlier talked about this and said you can't hold someone accountable for something they're not in control of. Um, similarly, you can't hold someone accountable for something that they literally can't do. What you can do is you can enable them to do it, and once they are able to do it, then you can hold them accountable. And that's essentially what Elmo is explaining here, where he says that um, the purpose of an accountability system is to focus the resources and capacities of an organization towards a particular end. Accountability systems can't mobilize resources that schools don't have. And therefore, 
the capacity to improve precedes and shapes schools' responses to the external demands of accountability system. And similarly, this bottom quote here just explains that um, the way that accountability should work is that for every increment of performance I um, demand from you, I should provide you with the capacity to give me that performance, if that makes sense. So in other words, you need to give, capacitate teachers before you hold them accountable for what you're asking them to do. Um, so that stresses the support element. Too often testing is seen as just accountability. It's accountability and support. It's both of these two things. Secondly, um, people sometimes uh, in economics, they're criticized for saying, if we just put the right incentives in place, everything will go hunky-dory. Everything will just align and, and become right. And that's not the case. And you'll find that in this literature, a lot of people talk about making the theory of change explicit. In other words, um, we need to be able to write down and show what exactly teachers need to do uh, who are in failing schools. What do they need to do tomorrow that they are not doing today to change what is happening in the system? Um, what should a failing student do tomorrow that he or she is not doing today? It's not good enough to just simply say, if you don't pass this test, you will fail, um, without then telling them, if you don't want to fail a test, you need to do these sections of your homework, um, go and read and do homework with your parents, sort of make it explicit what they need to do to meet that aim. Um, and again, this is looking at it from a system perspective where a theory of improvement actually has to account for how people in schools learn what they need to know in order to meet the expectations of the accountability system. And this is again something we should have in the back of our minds with Anna is when we identify an underperforming school, what exactly, specifically, detail, do we want that school to do in response to that information? Should they send their teachers for additional training? Should they phone the district office and ask for support? Should they make sure that they have their textbooks? Should they make sure the teachers arrive on time and that students aren't absent? Whatever it might be, we actually have to make those things explicit. We can't just say, you're a dysfunctional school or your school is underperforming, improve. They actually have to be um, ways made explicit of how they should improve. So, we mentioned earlier in uh, today's discussions about the importance of classification. We said that when you define a threshold, that can be very helpful to be able to say these students are literate, these students are illiterate, for example, because then we can target support to the illiterate kids. Similarly, we might say in this district there are so many illiterate kids all, um, and then we can help them to acquire those literacy skills. Similarly, if we can classify schools, not just students, but if we can classify schools into certain categories, then we'll better be able to target support to certain schools, rather than lumping all schools together. So, um, I've said here, yeah, there's a parallel with student test scores, uh, where it's helpful, and cost savings are also uh, one of the effects of classifying schools, because you avoid this booby trap of thinking that schools are infinitely complex. Sometimes when you speak to educators um, or sort of educational theorists, they'll say, oh, the environment and the context and the, all of these things are so complex that every single school is so unique, you need to tailor make a solution for every single school. And the problem with that is it cripples principals, it cripples departmental officials, because here you are trying to make policies that in some sense are generic um, of what we need to do to intervene in a school that's underperforming. And you're being told, no, this we need to take into account every single specific thing in this school. It doesn't necessarily help. Um, so what I've done here is taken all six grades, calculated the average of numeracy, the average of literacy, and then just divided by two. So I've created equal weights to all the grades and equal weights to both numeracy and literacy. <coughs> now, something that you would have seen when you were calculating when you were doing your pivot tables is you never want to base an average based on three people because it's not really an average. When you say, oh, the class average is 46%, but it's only based on three students because everyone is absent, it gives you a misleading picture to say that this is the class average. That's the average of three students. Similarly, um, what I've done here is excluded grades where there are less than 10 students in a grade, and I've also excluded schools where there are less than six grades in the school. Now, because Anna 2011, the data capturing was a little bit patchy, um, and that not all the data was captured in all the provinces, which we'll see later, um, 
to avoid misclassification and having a school that gets classified based on two grades, which only have 11 students in it, and we don't want to classify the whole school based on a small sample, um, what I've done is said they have to have at least six grade scores. So they must either have all six literacy scores, or all six numeracy scores, or four literacy and four numeracy, or four literacy and two numeracy. They must add up to six, but preferably we would want all 12. Um, but they have to have at least six to get to be classified like this and included in the analysis. So what we want to do is show you the results of school classification based on two provinces and two or uh, well, the districts within those provinces. Um, so firstly, we can look at it by quintile. So you can see here that how I've classified the schools is the red is dysfunctional schools. So that's when the average of grades 1 to 6 in numeracy and literacy, that score for the school, is less than 30% across all the grades. Okay? Then I've classified them as being dysfunctional. If it's um, yellow, which means it's between 30 and 40%, then it's underperforming, poor, good, great, excellent. Okay? Maybe it's too many categories, I think. For departmental purposes, it probably is too many categories. Probably four or five is more than enough, as long as they split in the right way. Um, but here it was useful because this is a, was a more fine-grained analysis. And we can see the two schooling systems that we have in South Africa. You have quintile 1 to 4, which have high numbers of dysfunctional and underperforming schools, compared to quintile 5, where you have a high, high number of um, good, great, and excellent schools, and a smaller number of dysfunctional and underperforming schools. Okay. So this is nothing, not necessarily new information. We could have got this from SACMEC, we could have got it from matric results, um, we could have got it from Pearls or Tim's. Categoriz categorization by province, um, also not necessarily anything new. We could have got this from other data. These district ones are new. Who can tell me something surprising about that provincial graph? Unexpected. Too small. There isn't a way to enlarge it, unfortunately. But feel free to move forward. <laughs> Can anyone see something funny about this graph? Eastern Cape is better than counting. Eastern Cape is better than counting, Free State, KZN. It's only second to the Western Cape. That seems very, very suspect, right? Not what we would expect. In other words, there are more uh, good, excellent, and great schools in the Eastern Cape than in Gauteng. We don't think so. Uh, not even on a good day. Um, the point, that what, what the situation is here, this is what the reason why we see this, uh, and we're going to come to it later, I'm not sure, I thought I'd put the slide before, but only 25% of the data in the Eastern Cape was actually captured. Now, which 25% of that data do you think got captured? Quintile 5. Who are the people that sent the responses to the DVE? The good schools, or at least the administratively good schools, which we think administration is probably very well correlated with, um, not only with wealth, because you might get quintile 2 schools that respond, but they'll be good quintile two schools. In other words, they've got good administrative systems. So we think that the 25% in the Eastern Cape that were captured were probably a very select sample of the Eastern Cape. This is in contrast to the Western Cape, uh, which is actually the only province that captured all of its data. All the other provinces captured sort of some degree of their data. Um, so, and I've got a huge caveat in this report. I think you should have the report, but we have said all provinces where they... Uh, where there is not 100% data that was captured, in other words, all provinces except the Western Cape, we should interpret this with extreme caution, particularly the Eastern Cape, because it only has 25% uh, data that was captured. So this is not what's happening in the Eastern Cape. The only reason why I actually chose to report it was to show what is possible if we had all the data. This is how we would do it. So this is looking at the Western Cape, and I mean, we have some people from the Western Cape, so uh, in my previous presentations, I have to say things like, these types of, of graphs are useful for people in, so you can actually tell me if you find it useful. Um, and say, this is not useful, we would never use it, or it is useful and we would use it. So basically, these are all of the districts in the Western Cape, 
And this is actually data you can't trust because all of the data was captured, although not externally verified. Um, but that's another point. And we can see here that there isn't actually that much variation across the, um, across the districts. You've got a higher performing uh, section of either good, great, or excellent schools in Metro Central and Metro South compared to Metro East and, what is this, Overburg? No, and the uh, Central Karoo region. Um, this is in stark contrast to somewhere like KZN, um, where there is a lot of difference, for example, between Umlazi and Obonjeni or Trehe. Uh, we've got a high proportion of almost 80% of schools in Obonjeni are either dysfunctional or underperforming for example. So the reason why this type of analysis we think is useful is as a provincial official you look at this and you can say okay we know where are our underperforming districts. Perhaps we already knew that based on matric results but we didn't know that based on primary school results. We can go one step further and instead of just looking at this at the district level we could even identify which specific schools are underperforming or dysfunctional or require targeted support as we'll see later. Thank you.